Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. Welcome, everyone. We are the Geek Patrol, and our microphones don't have a stun setting. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass and not Brandon. Brandon's not here. What happened, Well, we're, we're going to say he is out on assignment. How about that? It means he probably got in a, you know, he's in traffic or he's delayed or something. Is that what that, you know, assignment, I've heard this, you know, it's, there's all, that's sort of the utility for he's not here, but we have to make it sound important. Well, not that he's shirking yeah, I mean, his the, the fact that he is probably, you know, cussing a blue streak and trapped in traffic right now is, uh, okay. Yeah, you know, probably closer to the truth, but we're going to say he's out on assignment. Okay, so. well, he's going to miss out on an important conversation. He really would be, you and he would be the go-tos on this. I'm going to struggle along to keep up and to okay. be respectful, but uh, I guess we lost a, we lost a legend. I, even I know oh, this guy did. is a legend. Oh. Uh, Roger Corman passed Roger away. Roger Corman, man. The, now. Oh. So we're going to definitely talk about that. Uh, a beloved uh, a beloved figure for, for Alan and Brandon, and uh, maybe me, too. I think I saw Roger Corman at a convention years ago but i didn't know that's what i was seeing but he's uh, beloved for me because of silence of the lambs oh mm -hmm. oh okay good okay well i didn't know he had a hand in that that'll oh, be yeah. good max has quoted silence of the lambs quite a bit so no really thank you clary <laughs> uh we're also going to talk about something that when you see it on the internet or when you see it on youtube or something to me it looks like something right out of futurama the portal alan right Yep. Connecting New York to Dublin and soon probably well, the world. It was. Yeah. <laughs> Till some idiot. Yeah, there's always somebody that kind of, you know, whatever, has to undercut all that. Uh, but we've got that. We've got a couple other things. But, Max, also, this is a noteworthy occasion, and we thought we would let you uh, tell the listeners what that is. Well, I wanted to wish you-know-who, the great legendary George Lucas, a very happy 80th belated birthday. He looks pretty good for 80. I'd say so. Yeah, so he's 80 years old. What would the world look like without George Lucas? Or what would it look like without the filmmaker George Lucas? I don't, I mean... I don't know. He has been instrumental in so much. Disney Plus wouldn't exist. I mean... Uh, <laughs> I mean, would it? It's well, like, I mean, you know, for some bizarre reason, in spite of the fact that, you know, we had had a huge, huge surge in science fiction... Here comes this guy out of nowhere with not exactly the most original movie, not the most original, uh, really just kind of out there, but for some bizarre reason, Star Wars stuck. It was the one that everybody remembers. It's the one that started, kind of started the modern the modern realm of science fiction. You know what I think stands out for me about Star Wars? It didn't stand out for me as a kid. I didn't understand all the nuances, but we lived through the 70s, Alan. We did. Max, you weren't you weren't born yet, but I will tell you this, Max. There was it, we they said it it was a malaise. There was a funk. Movies <laughs> were very cynical. Movies were and shows were kind of always a little jaded and yeah, sarcastic. This and even science fiction, a lot of it was very, uh, you know, dystopian and yep. everything. And all of a sudden, a movie comes along that's fun, <laughs> and it's meant for all ages, and it's exciting. Right in the midst of all that, that takes a lot of guts. It would be easy to just go along with the with the crowd and just make something negative, but he didn't. And that, to me, was important. So. And I think one thing that kind of makes Star Wars stick um, uh, in terms of the general premise is the fact that it harkens back to, like, mythology and those universal themes of, the trials and tribulations of good versus evil. And I, I just really appreciate that about how it's rooted in this like primal simplicity. Timeless themes. No, yeah. American Graffiti was fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was a he fun movie. He made that for movie. no money. Yeah, it was just right. a fun movie. Right. Of, and it, for some reason, it, it just kind of shined above the others of a genre. And you could say that about Indiana Jones. He, I mean, um, now he and Steven Spielberg collaborated on that, right? But well, uh, yeah, but, but that's his baby, isn't it? Well, but it's it's these visions, and you notice that anything George got his hands on really had this kind of quirky uptick mm -hmm. of you know, I, I am one of the common actors that stayed with George through all of this was was. Harrison you know, Ford. Harrison Ford, you know, right. Han Solo or Indiana Jones or um, he was the guy driving the driving the rat rod in uh, American Graffiti. Right. 
Yeah. So just, you know, wow. It, it takes a certain kind of person to have that kind of vision to deliver those kind of products. They, yeah. They stuck. They're still with us today. So when you watch Star unbelievably Wars. Unbelievably well done, George. Yeah. And it's funny because you said that sometimes there, uh, you know, when you watch Star <clears throat> Wars or Indiana Jones, there's this sense of, okay, this plot is sort of straightforward. It's a, the it, premise is very simple to understand. And maybe there's something to that. We always talk about simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Maybe there's a beauty to that. So. And one thing that I always appreciate from the perspective of a creative is proper world building because George Lucas pretty much made a world that can expand infinite amounts of time and space and you can do anything with it. Well, that's true. I mean, Star Wars, you're literally, you got a whole galaxy mm. to play with and beyond really if you wanted to. So, but um, you know what's funny about George Lucas? I always wondered this because let's just be honest. We, we we appreciate his work. He is not the most dynamic speaker. He's kind of now he can he's articulate and he can say things, but he's not that he doesn't have that Stan Lee huckster rallying dynamic. No, no. And I wondered, I guess it must have worked to his advantage because he's still, you know, he he I did guess. all his work. But I wondered what it, what he would have been like if he was that person or if he was that more dynamic. They Whoa. said during Star Wars, you could hardly get a word out of him. He's like, oh, OK, go over there and. and move the light or something, but... Right, well, you know, sometimes I'm going to say it like this. Occasionally, there's the 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 uh, complaint about somebody that, well, they didn't do this or they didn't do that. But when you look at the finished product... It worked. You probably didn't need it. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's like, a... Well, it's funny. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we wouldn't even have had Indiana Jones. Maybe Star Wars wouldn't have been what it is. Uh, you know, maybe they a, took one look at it and said, yeah, I like what you did. I mean, we don't, I, I'm, I'm good. Let's yeah. move on. Right. And we wound up with a, a wide variety of franchises and side projects out of George Lucas that, well, I really still define the marketplaces today. We're still using their products and his characters. Yeah, and I would I would say a hundred years from now, people are still going to know who Jabba the Hutt is, and uh, there you go. They, yeah. They'll forget they'll forget us, uh, Alan, but uh, they'll always remember that. But uh, happy birthday, George Lucas! You are listening to Geek Tank Radio on ninety eight one The Max. Targ Burgers are now on the menu. The Geek Patrol is back. Is that a dry rub situation, oh, Alan, or was he, or, I don't <laughs> Absolutely. Know. Okay. I wanted to do something obviously Star Wars right. after well, we just talked about George Lucas. I also think it's appropriate here in the Mid-South with the uh, barbecue cooking contest. So Absolutely. Very, very well played, Max. And welcome back to uh, Geek Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And uh, notably absent is our buddy uh, Brandon Olmsted. I don't know where he's at. He just couldn't make it today. But uh, it's a shame that he can't because, Alan, uh, we've got somebody to uh, to pay tribute to. And now, a legend in geekdom. All right. Oh, I... he is. He is. Oh, my gosh. So much to unpack with Roger Corman. So Roger Corman. The, the, uh, the name is, you know, the name I think most people know. but The Pope of Pop Cinema. The King of Cult <laughs> himself. Uh, Roger loved... Low budget, fast moving, let's just get her done movies. Yeah. And well, he probably was forced to, right? It's not like the guy was rolling in money or anything. So, well, uh, or maybe he, he saw the value in it, doesn't have to be. Uh, he was ahead of his time, actually, because a lot of the things that are coming out now that we like the best are the ones that don't cost much. Like Late Night with the Devil. Well, and things it, like you that. know, so. it's welcome to Roger Corman for showing us that in 1962 you could take an unknown actor like Jack Nicholson put him in a weird a weird sci-fi involving a plant that eats people call it the little shop of horrors and launch and his we're career. still singing these songs 60 some odd years later well Alan I don't know a lot about Roger Corman oh. and there may be listeners that don't either so maybe this could also be an educational thing for people like us that to just kind of you know, give us the, who is Roger Corman? And yeah, Roger Corman was basically fast and cheap. Okay. You know, if you think of any of his movies, it was, let's get it done fast. Let's get it done cheap. And honestly, he really relied on the talents of who was in front of the camera. 
Okay. Because there's not going to be special effects. There's not going to be this. There's not going to be that. And if you really want to see his truly best work, go look up The Mask of the Red Death with Vincent Price. So his idea is to get really talented because, I mean, you're talking oh, Vincent Price gosh. and Jack Nicholson and people you're, like that. You're so. talking, you know, so many people got their first shot on a Roger Corman film hmm. because, you, you know, basically you knew you were going to get paid, you know, with a sandwich. Right. You knew, <laughs> the, you, knew you weren't going to be tied up for six months of shooting. You knew that... You know, you were going to get in, get this done, move on, and go. And just so many people. Uh, even Coppola, you know, worked with him. Scorsese worked with him. Jack Nicholson worked with him. Uh, Bill Shatner worked with him. And so many people worked with this man and made, you know, and they may not even be good movies. Yeah, they but may you not have been great movies. But we still are watching some of these movies. Well, I wanted to ask you, there's one. Now, I hope I'm right in this. I don't want to sound like an idiot. But, okay, we all know about the, the Fantastic Four. The, right. the Fantastic Four was the that what launched the Marvel. right. It, it's what launched the, uh, Mar the, Marvel, uh, the Marvel era, you could say, in comics. Well, the Fantastic Four is a very difficult... Uh, movie to it's a very difficult thing to adapt it works well in a cart in a comic in a in a cartoon but making a live action you know you got a stretching guy you got a rock guy you got an invisible right. woman everything about it is complicated but if you don't exercise if you don't make some something once every 10 years you can lose your copyright right, right? You, you lose your right to production Correct. so you could actually make a movie and not long and never even release it but you you make a movie and didn't he make a Fantastic Four he did. movie? And it's let now it's one of these bootleg things. It Probably everybody's seen it's it been on leaked, the internet. Right, right. It's been leaked. However, I and and they gave him like literally like I think less than a million dollars to make it. So the special yes. effects were awful. But I've I've heard, I've never seen it, but they say it is the most true to the source material Fantastic Four production ever. Even you know, even the newer ones that had a bigger budget, and I I find that interesting. He kept well, the again, spirit of it. You know, you don't you have nothing to fall back on. Yeah, you don't have uh, great special effects. You don't have lots of cool gadgets. And in in Roger Corman's effect, he didn't even have like Jim Henson to rely on. No, you know, so he had really nothing to fall back on other than just whatever they could do with their props people with the time they had, with the money they had. And the thing is, all of them really kind of gave it their best. And they they thought it was going to, they didn't make it for, with the notion this isn't going to be released. They were like, no, we're making <clears throat> a Everybody movie. Everybody was like, all right, they this were movie's all going out. Do the best you can. Um, if you go back and watch something like Death Race 2000. I've heard of that one. You That's will see it. so many major stars looking to get their, their, get, get their break. Uh, even Stallone's in it. And there are some of the worst puns, worst cracks. It's a terrible premise. It's an awful what movie. What is it? Isn't it like a <coughs> car race where they kill each other or something? Right, or they... Think like Hunger Games. Okay. Where like, you know, oh, you know, we're distracting the world from its problems by having a race where you get points for running around driving over people. Okay, right. And the racers try to kill each other off too. And you wind up with just some horrible puns that are just amazing. The movie is terrible, but it's so much fun to watch. You will watch it over and over again. Does the does his stuff kind of realize what it is, though, and that's what makes it good? Self-aware? Well, they mean? totally lean into it. So, like, when he does, like, Piranha. All right, what's the point oh, of the I movie? Oh, I saw that movie. Giant, yeah. giant mutant fish eating people. All right, let's go. Let's give them a sound you stick effect. Stick your leg in the over and the your boat leg and, gets, and you, you know right. when you watch something like he did with Vincent Price though those were l just pure. Let's do the scene. Let's get Mask of the Red Death done and turn Vincent Price loose and just let him have it. It's amazing it's, that he worked with the people he worked. It's oh. almost like he had a sense of I better get this guy while I can afford him before. Wait, well, Jack Nicholson getting right. fed to a plant. Come on, it's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, Roger Corman actually sounds in a lot of ways like he was ahead of his time. 
And there's probably a lot of good lessons that uh, current filmmakers could learn from this great man. So we're going to continue to talk about it when we come back here on Geek Tank Radio. You're listening to Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. The Geek Patrol is back. That's where I saw the leprechaun. Right, a leprechaun. He told me to burn things. Boom. What could Roger Corman have done with that premise? There you yes. go. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a franchise right there. And welcome back to uh, Geek Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And Brandon is out on assignment, we suppose. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not here. That's all we know. Uh, today, it's interesting. We were talking, well, we're celebrating a life, and then we're also celebrating a passing. It's a, a, a belated happy 80th birthday to George Lucas. We covered that earlier in the show. Uh, we are also paying tribute to Roger Corman, who passed away. Now, Alan, he passed away at 98. Oh, Talk well about played, a guy man. having a long run, a oh. good run. It's not as tragic when you when you consider it that way. But off the air, you and I were talking, and I'm uh, in fairness, I'm not as familiar with Roger Corman as you are. I mean, you're you're an aficionado, Max. Uh, this was way before your era, but um, oh, Max, it sounds you are like going to be a convert. This was the, he was your producer. He really was. I mean, I've heard of some of his work too, like especially the fact that like he had his hand in Silence of the Lambs. That was that yes. was right right up my alley. Yeah, I wanted to get to Silence of the Lambs, but I did have a question, Alan, because off uh, before the break, you were telling us about Death Race two thousand. Oh yeah, and when you when you tell us about the premise, and uh, it sounds to me like a precursor to uh, oh, Mad Max. I'm sure those any, movies were influenced. Oh by my it, gosh, but. any post-apocalyptic movie that has race cars and people getting whacked <laughs> goes back to Death Race For 2000. sport and fun. Yeah, oh, like... my gosh. It's so terrible. So let's go back to about 1950. Roger gets his uh, cuts his teeth on a movie called The Gunfighter. And, okay. I'm going to guess it's a Western. It was a Western. It was, yeah. easy, it was, easy, to, it was easy to film. Not a big thing. Of, and then, of course, he just, you know, four years later went for the monster from the ocean floor. Mm-hmm. And then next That's thing you know. That's what it's called? Yep. It was a monster <laughs> from the ocean floor. Then there was a beast with a million eyes. It conquered <laughs> the world, swamp women. But he really, really starts to hit when we get to 1959 and he comes up with the wasp woman. You know what? A he's great at coming cool up with thriller. He's great at coming up with titles because I've always been a fan of branding where you hear the title and you know what the thing's about. Yes. Everything yeah, wasp woman. Then there was okay. Attack of the Giant Leeches. My then he really hits <laughs> then he hits my trick. Because okay. now we got the fall of House of Usher, the Pit and the Pendulum, Mask of the Red Death. Oh, he's so, getting, I mean, so he's now getting, he's uh, getting seriously here. into yeah. Edgar Allan Poe. He's working with Vincent Price. Of uh, in 1960, he cast an unknown fella by the name of Jack Nicholson in a movie where plants eat people, right. The Little Shop of Horrors, with the most earworm oh uh, m- music in it. Oh yeah. my gosh, it just won't ever let you go. Of <clears throat> so welcome, welcome to Roger's legacy. It's just story after story after story. And if you really want to see all the heroes of 60s horror all together in one, go find a copy of The Raven yeah. or Tales of Terror. Yeah, Either one, both by Roger, absolutely amazing. And then you start getting into more modern things and... It just doesn't. It just doesn't end because he even had an effect with the Godfather. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. He to was, what degree <clears throat> was he involved with the Godfather? Again, I mean, production. Okay. Well, um, there was some violence in that movie, you know. Well, sure. you know, even a big major hit like Big Bad Mama was a Roger Corman production. Okay. Of, but what about was, Silence of the Lambs? We got to get well, to that. You got we you to get down there, and again, more in production and atmosphere. Because let's face it, this guy was the was the king of all right. We got no mud, no money. Cover the windows, put a drape over that, and now it looks dark and creepy. And we got atmosphere. Well, the creepiest part of me, to me, because I I don't have a stomach for horrors, you know. And there's great dialogue, there's great acting in there. But that dude that had the thing in it that, that he had the girl trapped in his Buffalo base, Bill. Well, 
from yep. a set design perspective, how hard was that? It's literally exactly. It, it wouldn't have cost a lot, but yet that that sticks that. in my mind, and it was horrifying and scary. So that's good budget management, and know. also the idea of like utilizing the actors to their fullest. But maybe mm. Corman had his a um, hand in that too, because one thing I learned about there's this famous scene where. Um, uh, they talk about where the title, The Silence of the Lambs, comes from because of the trauma that Clarice experienced. Originally, they had planned in the script to have a flashback of Clarice with the lambs that were screaming and, you know, like their dialogue between her and Dr. Lecter. But her eye contact was so intense and the moment was so intimate that they decided to just keep the eye contact between the two actors as part of the scene instead. Well, it's funny you say that, man. That's exactly right because uh, Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster, okay, they're standing at a cell. They're taught how much could that have cost to make? And that's some of the most kind of gripping parts and it sticks with you. And especially that dialogue. And so you don't have to build a million dollar set. You keep it simple. And like you said, cut loose the actors and give them well, something and to I'm going to go back to his early work with Vincent Price, because if you watch early Vincent Price movies, it wasn't about the mountain's going to fall on top of people. Mm -hmm. You were you were freaked out in the, you know, the house of wax that those were really people under the wax. Oh, right. You know, right, and what right. freaked you out was the little tiny things. And Roger was really good at giving you those moments of even in, you know, bad knockoff movies he did. Like in 1993, he did Carnosaur, which was... Humans getting turned into dinosaurs. <laughs> and, you know, and it, his his twist at the end was, you know, we found a cure, we've saved humanity, and yet the government comes sweeping in and manages to wipe all that out. You know, like, spoiler, oh. but yeah, yeah, no, I mean, but uh, it sounds <clears throat> like he understands a lot of fundamental storytelling principles that, well, that always will work. And, you know, when you get to 1994, when they were making the Fantastic Four, Again, no budget or anything like that, but he really did try to make as good a movie as he could make. And if you go back and look at the pictures, the thing is absolutely terrifying. Oh, well, Miss, uh, you know, Reed Richards, when he's stretching, it's literally a guy with like an extension pole. And, it's an yeah. extension pole stretching an arm a down hand. a hallway and stuff. Right. So, you know, welcome to these things. But you know what? You go back and watch them, and you watch them fondly. Yeah. So so well done, Roger Corman. You've lived it. You had a great run, and you will be missed. You're listening to Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. The Geek Patrol is back. We couldn't even convince you that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Oh, come on. That millionaire playboy, he's too busy socializing at cocktail parties and managing the affairs of the Wayne Foundation. <laughs> I mean that's what I thought for years, Alan. Uh, it took mm. me a while to get the, to get that figured out, but um, he Oof. makes a lot of sense. Mm. And welcome back to uh, <laughs> Geek Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here at my friends Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And uh, uh, returning next week, I'm sure our buddy Brandon Olmstead. He's just not here. He something came up, so it happened uh, on assignment. On assignment. If you're just tuning in, uh, we, we, of course, earlier in the show, Max paid, uh, well, all of us paid tribute to George Lucas, a belated 80th birthday, talking about the great man. We also talked about another great man, Roger Corman, who mm. passed away at the age of 98. And, uh, Alan, if people want to hear any of our past shows, if they miss this and they're just kicking themselves that they... They, they missed out. Don't worry. There's ways to hear it, right? There uh, are indeed. The best thing in the world to do is just go to geektankradio.com and follow along with our full podcast with, honestly, Joe, years and years and years of content all there for you as a podcast with YouTube. And I will say this. It's coming up. It's not. We, we're. We're not there yet, but we're getting very close. We are entering into our 10th year we are. of Geek Tank Radio. So we're talking a decade of content. Absolutely. And, and nonstop, we've basically been very few interruptions with it. So, I mean, uh, yeah, we've that's been fairly cool. consistent for over, yeah, for almost a decade. It's getting close to the anniversary. We'll have to do something big for that 10 year <clears throat> anniversary. But, uh, Alan, you know, we always hear that term, uh, well, there's reasons we can't have anything nice. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> there's some technology that's out there that came about, uh, and it really it does look like something out of Futurama. But go ahead, Max. Can uh, I read the article? Okay. Or just the title of the article? Yeah. Tears, laughs, and bare butts. Beam through the portal linking Dublin and New York. <laughs> mm. So this portal, if I'm correct, because I haven't done as much research as you did, but I saw a video 
of uh, there's a there's a you know on a busy New York street there's this big round screen it looks right. like and there's people looking into they're basically talking in real time to people in in uh, Dublin correct and so it looks the same on the other side of course troublemakers uh, had to flash themselves well, uh, and uh, oh, bear bear yeah. all. I'm surprised that you don't get arrested. In New York, I guess they're pretty lenient about that stuff. But uh, anyway, Alan, I, I don't know that we want to lean into that, but this is a, the new technology. I mean, we've seen FaceTime and everything, but this is Welcome. taking it to a new level. I mean, you could have a big screen in your home with one of these things, maybe. Well, and yeah, so, again, we've been talking a lot about sci-fi today, and welcome to... You know, we got wristwatches that you can watch TV shows on these days. Yeah. So we have a uh, basically an internet camera portal set up, and you were able to interact with uh, a street scene in New York and a street scene in Dublin. Okay, here is my question, though, because if I'm observing, <laughs> we've all seen these news reports. They're like, so, so Bob, tell us about the hurricane over there in, in Florida. And then there's like, one, two, three, four, before the guy actually hears it in his earpiece. So there's this. Correct. Is this, is there the same kind of hesitation in this or is this boom? This. Very uh, little. If, well, all right. The problem there is they were switching between network systems to bring you that. Uh huh. And it, that's the network switching system. This is a direct link. So there's no So there's delay. a video camera and a mic on both ends. Boom. And you basically. There's a few milliseconds difference between the both ends. Not so noticeable. For all intents and purposes, it's real time. That's I gotta, different. I yeah. got to ask, why did they choose um, a Dublin in New York? And not only that, but the artist who created this was Lithuanian. And so it gets yes. really muddied. Wait, it's an artist? Yeah. Yes, this was an art project to connect these two points around the world. And, uh, you know, well, you choice, can say that about any two. I mean, why Rome and New York? Why... Well, Cleveland you know, that, that was whatever. just the yeah. choices that were made. And, of course, there's a lot of permitting and things like that mm. to go into it. So, happened to be that the U.S. and Ireland were both uh, very amenable to the project. It doesn't seem like it's going to be long <clears throat> before any of us could do this, though. I mean, if really all we're talking about is a different size screen. Yes. Uh, this was basically like a, you know, we all got used to during the pandemic, you know, having those uh, streamed meetings. So this was basically just, you know, a quick snapshot from one street corner to another. So welcome to New York and welcome to Dublin. Here's where my mind goes, Max. Okay. Well, okay. You've got a screen that's eight feet across. What if you had a screen that's 40 feet across and you've got a business or you've got a, and, and your, your London branch is just on the other side of the screen of the of your of you know Cleveland branch, and yeah. you're more or less feeling like you're in the same room with each other. Maybe it's yes, you're in a border, and that creates a different way. You're going to communicate differently. It's like you're right there. It, it's a whole you know? different vibe, Joe. It's it kinda, a whole different vibe. Kind of makes me think of how they have like in certain businesses, they would have like the world clocks. Like, mm. oh, it's London. It's this time in London or whatever. You also wonder if the different sizes of the screen is less likely to attract let's just say ne'er do wells because it's like they have a bigger screen to you know to where their work is noticed so to say well here's the other thing and we know this is coming alan when will gene simmons and kiss monetize this because let's think about it you're the ultimate kiss fan you've got your screen and gene and all the guys are sitting on the other side of it doing whatever they're doing and now you've got them life-size in your living room with you and maybe you can even send them questions like you would on a Facebook chat or something like that. You know there's something coming like that. Well, I mean, yeah. The, well, in this particular instance, there is, of course, the fan site, OnlyFans. Oh, there and you go. And OnlyFans yeah. is for, well, yeah, adult we entertainment. And an OnlyFans model uh, had, uh, had seen the portal and decided to give Dublin... Yeah. A sneak preview of what's available on her OnlyFans site. Yeah. So she, Shameless promotion. So she flashed, you know, so she flashed Dublin. And and that kind of began the one-upmanship to it wound up with the portal being turned off. Right. Well, they got to have some, yeah, <clears throat> you some know, dignity is, here. The, the point of the portal was not to one-up each other with, right. you know, various asundered stunts. 
So the portal was shut down for now. All right. Well, we'll be following this because it's this is just the beginning. We know we know what it else is, is coming. It but is. Uh, uh, it's not the beginning of the show. It's the end because we're out of time. So we it's are. time to get out of here. Uh, so until next week, we are the Geek Patrol, and I am Joe Thorderson. I'm Maximilian. And I'm Alan Gilbert, reminding you that, you know what? Some of your best work just might happen to be fast and cheap. Boom.